this is not the beginning. This is Christmas Eve. In a church that's been around for 180 years, you have all heard this story before. We know what happens to the baby in the manger. We've been coming to this service for our whole life. This is not the beginning. But at the same time, this is not the end either. No matter how dramatic we might be feeling, this is actually not the end of the world. Despite the fact that every news organization on the planet wants us to panic and freak out and feel like it is the end with every headline they sell you, the reality is this is not the end. Have you noticed lately that like everything is the end of the world? <laughs> everything is the end of the like they cannot tell us about the first snowstorm of the season without fitting in the word apocalypse. <laughs> right? I mean, yes, it's bad out there, but I mean, we do this every year, right? We're Michiganders. We know how to deal with some snow. But it's the end of the world. I mean, how many times back in October and November did we hear this is the most important election cycle of our life? And they said the same thing in 2020 and in 2016 and in 2008 and in, 2000, and in basically every single time. They say this is the most important one. And yet the election came and went and somehow it's not the end of the world. I think that catastrophic end of the world mentality, it seeps into our daily life. It, it seeps into the way we think, right? Like, oh, if I don't get the perfect gift for my kid, it's the end of the world. If I don't get that bonus at work, it's going to be the end of the world. If I don't get, you know, if I miss my kid's recital or my kid's soccer game or that wrestling match, it's going to be the end of the world. I saw a movie recently. It was, a, it was a really cute kids movie. It was a Christmas movie called Arthur Christmas. Anybody ever see Arthur Christmas? You familiar? Some, maybe, few. It's really cute. It was a lot of fun, but it was extremely dramatic, right? The whole point of the movie was like, out of all the billions of kids, one kid got skipped and their gift might be late. It was gonna be like a couple minutes late and that was gonna shake this child's belief in Santa and belief in Christmas and it was gonna ruin everything. <laughs> Have you noticed that every Christmas movie has the same premise. Whatever's going on is going to ruin Christmas. That's why I love the book and the movie, uh, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. I love, I love the Jim Carrey version. It's so much fun. But the whole point is like he takes all the pieces of Christmas away, and then it came just the same. I'm so sorry. Spoilers. Right? <laughs> How the Grinch. It's been out for like 75 years. I think we're okay. Um, but the whole point of that story is that Christmas is not easy to ruin, right? Like he took everything away and it still came because it's not that easy to get rid of. And I almost, you know, honestly, the more I think about it, I almost wish he had maybe just tipped all those presents off the mountain, right? Just, just let it go to kind of drive home that point that there's nothing that can hurt Christmas. You know, the, it's not the end of the world, you know, the Bible talks about the end of the world, like the actual end of the world. In Revelations, the very last book in the Bible, in Revelations 21, this is like, I'm on the second to last page of the whole thing, right? And it says in chapter 21, verse 3, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people and he will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or sorrow, or crying, or pain. All these things are gone forever. It's like this incredible picture of heaven where there will be no more crying, no more mourning, no more pain, but, but we still have all that stuff, right? So it's clearly not the end of the world. We're not there yet. So where does that leave us? It's not the beginning. We've done all this before. We've come a long ways, but it's, it's not the end of the world either. We are stuck somewhere in the middle. The truth is, with the birth of Christ, we enter into a new phase. To shamelessly quote the Marvel Universe, we are in the end game now. It's the beginning of the end. Let me show you what I mean. We jump into our scripture lesson today in Luke chapter 1, and it says at the very end of the chapter, because there's, well, let me tell you, this guy, Zechariah, he's best known as John the Baptist's dad. Right? And so this guy, Zechariah, he gives an, a prophecy right before Jesus is born. And he does this whole big prophecy. He says in verse 78, he says, Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break 
upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. The entire meaning of Christmas is wrapped up in those two verses right there, right? Because of God's tender mercy, because of how much he loves you, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us. I want you to imagine you're in a valley and you're just sitting in darkness and it's cold and it's a dark winter night, but up on the ridge, a light is beginning to peek over the edge, right? You, it's like a gradual lightness that's still far off. You can see that it's coming. You know the dawn is coming, but it's not there yet. There's another translation I really love that says that the dawn from on high is about to break upon you. And it keeps going. It says that it will give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. That phrase, shadow of death, it kind of pulls on our memory, right? Does anybody know where it comes from? It's the phrase they use in Psalm 23. It's like the most famous psalm ever, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me, right? It's about the only time I actually like the King James Version, right? It's so poetic. It's beautiful. I love the way it says it. So it says the shadow of death. It means I'm not dead yet, right? This life hasn't killed me yet, but I am walking in the valley of the shadow of death. And that's one thing I love about the Christmas story. Despite Hollywood, we don't actually have to be sing-song happy all the time. Sometimes we're making it to the end of this season stumbling, we're just falling for yards, barely making it to the finish line. Is anybody like that tonight? I'm like that. Coming into this holiday season, I'm like, we're almost there. I can't, you know, we're just barely tiptoeing past that, that touchdown. Basically, what the prophecy is saying is that the dawn is coming. We have been hunkered down, surviving the cold, hard winter night, but there is hope that comes with the morning, and the morning is almost here. The morning light from heaven. Now, it doesn't take a genius to pull apart that symbolism, right? You don't have to be an expert in prophecy to see that God's tender mercy and light breaking into the darkness, having that two sentences before baby Jesus shows up, it's pretty obvious, right? Jesus is the light. Jesus is the light in the darkness. But what is the darkness? The passage keeps going in chapter 2, and it says, At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken in the Roman Empire. This is the first census where taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all returned to their ancestral towns to register for the census. So, so Jesus is the light. It looks like the darkness is government-mandated paperwork, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, we all know what a census is, right? Because we still have those around today, right? So the census, what's a census? The government needs to know how many people live where, and they need to know because... Taxes, right? They want to know how much money they're going to get. That's what they care about. That's why they do that. And so I looked it up. Genesee County has a little over 400,000 people, right? And you register for that kind of stuff at the Secretary of State. You want to know how many secretaries of state we have in Genesee County? Five. There are five. According to countyoffice.org, that's one Secretary of State for 82,176 people. Now, I haven't been to a Secretary of State in a little while, but you remember what they're like, right? It's like a little postage stamp of an office in a strip mall with six brown chairs and two clerks rocking five windows. Is this what you've experienced, right? This is what the Secretary of State is. So now imagine the government hands down a mandate, and they say, all right, everybody up. We're going to count all of you. There's no mail-in ballots. There's nobody going door to door. You all have to go into the office to register in person. That would be a nightmare right? Just an absolute nightmare. Now, you take that situation and add the birth of the Christ child, right? Mary is pregnant. Pregnancy all by itself is, is painful and, and difficult and inconvenient. And then add to that the whole, she's pregnant, but she's not married. He's not the father, right? Like, that's an uncomfortable conversation to have in the modern world. I can't imagine what it would have been trying to explain it to friends and family back then. This is uncomfortable, on top of awkward, on top of stressful, and that's before you get to the government-mandated paperwork. So best I'm reading this symbolism, the morning light from heaven is Jesus, and the shadow of death, the darkness, it's just 
regular life, the chaos of normal life. Sometimes you don't have to have some great big evil bad guy like Grinch or Scrooge or whatever. Sometimes life itself and all its busyness and all the distractions and all the pushing and pulling us in a thousand different directions. Maybe you're grieving the loss of a loved one or you're struggling at work or you're feeling isolated and alone or depressed or maybe you're feeling touched out and overwhelmed because there's too many people in your life. Whatever it is, sometimes the darkness that we're talking about is just found in normal everyday life. The darkness really does seem to be a symbol of just good old-fashioned human chaos. So what I'm trying to tell you tonight is that you need God every single day, right? Definitely, we need to reach out to God when everything's falling apart and life feels like it's unhinged, but we also need God when it's not falling apart, when we feel like we're doing okay, maybe we're just tired, and then we also need God even when things are going great and you're well-rested. We need the light all the time. The coming of the morning light gives us hope and peace no matter what situation. Jesus is the light in the darkness, bringing peace on earth. I mean, that's the phrase, right? Bringing peace on earth. But hold on a second. Jesus brings peace on earth, but he came as a baby. How does a baby bring peace? In my abundant experience, Babies make a lot of noise, right? Like a lot of noise. That's one of my favorite things about this church. We got like four or five families who all have littles, right? And they all are always running around. They make a ton of noise. I'm not going to lie to you. There's a solidarity when the screaming kid's not mine, you know? Because <laughs> most of the time it's my kid, but then every now and then it's not. And it's like, I get it. You know, like there's just this, this, this like connection we have. Because we don't have to apologize for our kids because we, you know, parents, we just, we get it. <laughs> babies bring chaos. That's what babies do. Babies bring chaos. Parents have to work very hard to get a little peace and quiet, right? So how does Jesus bring peace if he shows up like a snot-nosed peace destroyer? <laughs> but that's the thing about babies, isn't it? Babies are magic. When a baby is freaking out, it erases all divisions, doesn't it? It becomes the most important thing to take care of that baby. Oh, no, no, no. We're fighting, but no, no, stop. Baby, right? We have, when a baby's freaking out, let, let's use the church pew as an example. I see it all the time. Somebody brings a baby into church and the baby's getting fussy and wiggling. The people behind the pew turn into babysitters, right? Like the kid's facing backwards and mom's like patting him on the back trying to get him to not, not make noise because it's so stressful to have a kid who's making noise in church, Right? And the people behind them, they're like wiggling fingers and making faces at the baby, doing whatever they can to try and help out, right? Like mom's rummaging in the diaper bag. I got to find something. Dad's out parking the donkey. And it's just like she's all by herself. <laughs> and it's like, do you need me to hold that baby for you? That's what I found. This church, we got a lot of people who are more than willing to hold my babies, right? It's actually hard to hold on to your babies in this church. Sarah, my wife, will come up to me and be like, will you hold one of our thousand children? And she'll be like, here, hold this one. And I'll be like, great. And then, like, she'll come back five minutes later. Kid's gone. And she's like, where is it? I don't remember. Someone took him. <laughs> He's somewhere. <laughs> they do. Oh, they do. I, I leave with as many as I started with every time. It's good. Babies can turn friends into, or enemies into friends. Two ladies could be mad at each other, and they're fighting, and they're arguing, but the baby starts freaking out. Oh, no, no, no. we got to tend to the baby. Now we're on the same team. We need to help this kid out. Jesus brought peace, but he didn't come down and just tell us all, get along. He came as a baby, and he got everybody around him to bring peace. Do you see how that works? Jesus brought peace through empowerment, encouraging people to work to bring peace. Jesus brought peace through other people. Here's what I want you to remember. Jesus, you, you are the reason Jesus came down to this earth. You are the reason that Jesus came down. He looked down from heaven, he saw you, and he chose to save you. You are the desire of the Almighty. God loves you so much, and all he wants is your love in return. Right? I'm not one of those pastors who's going to get up here and like lean on the guilt and the shame. I'm not going to get up here and be like, you're a dirty little sinner and you need God's love. Because I don't have to. In my ministry, I have never had to convince someone they're messed up. Right? 
Because we know, right? We know we're messed up. We don't need any encouragement on that. I've never needed to convince, right? Because we already know all of us have hurt somebody. We've lied, cheated, stolen, gotten jealous, bullied people, whatever it is. And this is myself included. I have done some stuff in my past I am not proud of. But whatever it is, we've all messed up. And God sees us broken and messy. This is so important. He sees you, not like cleaned up you Christmas Eve. You know, I got my vest on, right? (laughs) No, no, no. He sees you broken and messy. And he still says, I choose you. I choose you. God actually cares about you. You are the desire of the Almighty. You are the desire of the divine. All of this, all of this happened so you could meet God. Because God loves you. In fact, God loves you so much that he has chosen to work through you to save the world. Think about how a baby brings peace, right? God delights in working through you. We have a chance to be the hands and feet of God out in the world. In the Bible, there's all these stories, awesome stories about God and how he works in the world. He does incredible things. Like in the Old Testament, he's like parting the Red Sea and Egypt and all that stuff. God does, and he's so, so powerful, But ever since Jesus showed up, God has chosen to work through his people. That's my big teaching for tonight. I want you to realize that the method of peace that God has chosen is empowerment. After Jesus rose from the dead, before he went up into heaven, he promised, he said, I'm going to send my spirit to be with you. That's the Holy Spirit. There's a peace of God that lives in each of us. Right? There is a peace of God that is hidden in each of our hearts. It gives us motivation. It gives us the ability to change the world. It's this discontent that we've got inside of us, this like thing. Some people call it curiosity. Some people call it hope. It's just this idea, this gut feeling we've got that there is something more out there. God loves you, and God is with you. You've probably heard that phrase, Emmanuel, right? Emmanuel translates as God with us. God is with us. But I want you to think about that. It doesn't say God was with us thousands of years ago. It says God is with us right here, right now, tonight, Christmas Eve, 2022, in Flushing United Methodist Church. God is with us. Or if you're joining us on the live stream, wherever you are, God is with you. And he's going to be with you when you step out of the store tonight. This is not the beginning of the story. We've done all this before. This is not the end of the story. We've got a long ways to go. This is the beginning of the end. Here's the takeaway. Jesus is the light of the world. The morning light from heaven is about to break upon our cold, broken darkness. And the way that the light works, I know this is going to be super obvious, but the way the light works is it helps you see Right? The ability to see is empowering. Have you ever tried to get across your living room in the dark? Right? I can do it, but I'm going to bump my shin on every single piece of furniture. Right? And we all know the devil invented Legos, so you could step on them in the middle of the night. The worst. <laughs> the light is so important. Jesus is the light, and the light is there to help you see. And now that you can see, it's time for you to take a step forward. Zechariah's prophecy says that the light came to guide us to the path of peace. Jesus came to bring us peace, but he didn't come to fix all our problems for us. He shows us the path. He shows us the right way to live. And then once we can see, we have to take that first step down the path. The birth of Christ is the beginning of the end. The birth of Jesus puts the power in your hands. You have it within you to save the world. With your life, you can bring either good or evil. And I'm just asking you to choose to put your life towards bringing peace in a broken world. And I know most of you are sitting here, you're like, jeez, man, leave me alone, right? That's a bit much. I just came here for a nice little Christmas Eve service. I got to get home, put the kids to bed, wrap a couple gifts, finish prepping, so tomorrow I can eat entirely too much food. I don't need all this saving the world nonsense, right? It's way too much. Here's the thing, you can't sit on the sidelines of life. I think it was Bob Marley who once said, the people making the world worse aren't taking any days off, so I can't either. You can't sit on the sidelines. Doing nothing is a really lazy way to do evil. What we do today determines what tomorrow's gonna look like. And so what tomorrow are you working for? What world do you wanna see, right? Is this the world you want? 
Look around. Is this what we want to live in? Or is there some small, simple way that you could work to bring peace in our world? With this message of empowerment comes responsibility. You've been given a gift. There's a peace of God living within you in the still silence of the night. You can hear the voice of God speaking from your heart, guiding you on the path of peace. Ask yourself, is this the world you want? Or is there something you could do to make the world a better place? You see... (laughs) Ask yourself the question, why is there still hate in the world? You understand we are the answer, right? Why is it, you know, those horrible moments in life when you ask yourself, where was God in this? You know that we're the answer, right? Where were the Christians? Where were God's people? Are we going to stay on the sidelines or are we going to make the world better? God loves you. God is with you and Jesus is coming. We have a lot of work to do. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth, and he did that for you. This is not the beginning. In the end, God is going to wipe away every tear, and there will be no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow. But we still have all that stuff, so this is not the end. But the birth of Jesus puts us in the end game. This is the beginning of the end. Our time of empowerment where you can get out there and make the world a better place so that it can be his kingdom come his will be done. Someday Jesus is coming back. That was the promise he made when he left. He said, I'm coming back. What are you going to be doing when he gets here? This is the beginning of the end. Amen.